Okay, welcome everybody. Um, I'm very delighted that you could all be here today. I would like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. Today I'm attending from the lands of the Gamilaroi people. I recognise their continuing connection to this land and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. And I extend that respect to all Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people present today. Please feel free to share where you're watching from today in the chat and we'll monitor that throughout the session. Now I'd like to welcome the ALIA president, Vicky Edmonds, to give her a welcome. Thank you so much, Amy. I would also like to acknowledge that we're meeting today on various Aboriginal lands. Today I'm on the Darug and Gundungurra lands and I'd like to pay my respect to Elders past and present while recognising the strength, capacity and resilience of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, people in all of our various regions. As Amy said, I would um, encourage you to put where you are watching from in the chat. It's always nice to uh, see where everybody is watching from. And look, I am very excited about today's um, session on website accessibility. This is something that I've, I have only just become aware of in the last 12 months, building a website to make it accessible for everybody. I didn't realise that there were ways that you could make um, websites much more functional for everybody um, to build in scripts, to make sure that it's... Um, accessible on not only a computer or a laptop or that there's a mobile version of your uh, website. There is just so much that you can do and very simple things to make sure that everybody gets the same information. So uh, thank you for putting this session together. I think that we'll uh, all learn a lot today and uh, we need to be going out and telling everybody about this um, and making them aware. If we're putting out for tenders to rebuild our website for any of our libraries or any of our information services, we need to have that functionality built into the tender or in with the consultants that we are employing for these projects. So thank you so much, Amy, and I will um, stay for about half an hour. I'm so sorry I have to leave um, in half an hour, but I'm desperate to hear what, what I can learn today. So thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Vicky. Thank you for your welcome. Okay, we're going to jump straight in. Firstly, um, I would like to introduce our first guest speaker for today. The team at Centre for Inclusive Design is here to talk about website accessibility. So I will hand over to, um, I think it's Michelle, um, hand over to Michelle and we'll get the ball rolling. Thanks, Amy. I'm just going to set up my share screen and make sure that that's all good to go. Yep. Is everyone able? That's great, Michelle. That's great. Thank you, Michelle. Yeah. Cool. So with that all working for me, then hello, everyone. My name is Michelle O. My pronouns are she, her. I am an inclusive user experience and service designer at the Center for Inclusive Design. We're a social enterprise and we work with business, government and non-government organizations um, to help them design products and services that better serve everyone, not just some, by working with community um, that they would like to serve. Um, I would like to start also by doing a little bit of an audio description of my appearance for anyone in the call. Um, I have light skin, dark brown eyes, straight brown black hair, and I'm wearing a gray knit. Um, it's a bit of a turtleneck because I'm a bit of a weakling with the cold. Um, although it is nice and sunny where I am today, I'm dialing in from Gadigal land and thank you so much for doing the acknowledgement of country at the beginning of the call. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples on the call today. Um, our team works across Gadigal land as well as Wurundjeri land. And I apologize for any of the construction noises that may be coming through the call from my end. What I'm here to talk to you all about today is inclusive design as well as accessibility. Um, so a little bit of a broader lens 
on accessibility as a whole. I'll be moving into inaccessible web experiences lightly, as well as some tips and tricks on what we can do day to day um, to improve the inclusivity and accessibility of our web content and information that we bring out into the world. So let's kick us off by looking at what exactly do we mean when we talk about inclusive design and accessibility. So inclusive design, we define as human-centered design that considers the full range of human diversity as part of the design process. And when we're talking about the full range of human diversity, we're talking about things such as ability, language, culture, gender, age, and all and any other forms of human difference. Diversity is really the reality of our human experience. So just like our DNA or our fingerprint, we're all unique individuals. And while we do have some similarities and things that are in common between us, our different backgrounds, different experiences mean that we interact with and experience the world in different ways, um, in our unique ways, and everyone has different needs. So if you think about your mobile phone, Another person with the same model of mobile phone, whether it be an iPhone or a Samsung or another Android, will not have the same home screen, apps or settings as you do because we all use our phones in our unique ways. So we need to design inclusively, especially when it comes to digital communication and information, because these are becoming the foundations for business and interacting with our increasingly digital world. So it's important that everyone that you serve, regardless of their differences, has the experience of being able to access and understand what you're sharing with them. Let's unpack inclusive design a little bit more by looking at the two words that it's made up of. Um, in Inclusive is a little bit hard to define because it can mean different things for different people. For myself personally, in Inclusive is a feeling where I don't feel out of place and I know that my voice will be heard and respected. Um, inclusion we can think of as a process for making sure that everyone can participate and feel like they belong in society. And the outcome of inclusion is equity. Moving into the word design, um, we often think about designers as the people with those fancy occupations who look at aesthetics, color and form. And while this is still true, design is also an action that we're doing every day. When you communicate with people through emails or when you're organizing meetings such as this event, um, you're designing interactions between people. When you're creating content or organizing information, such as in Word documents, presentations, web content, you are designing. Whenever you're imagining, planning, creating something with intention, when you're problem solving, you are a designer. So never discount the power that you have to be part of the process of making the world more inclusive. So where does accessibility sit in all of this? Hang in there, I'm getting there. Um, let's look at the inclusive design framework, which is a neat little way to think about where accessibility fits within inclusive design. Um, so the inclusive design framework is made up of can I get there, can I play there, and can I stay there? I'll give you an example in a moment. Accessibility tends to sit into that first can I get there, but also stretches across the other spaces too. So in terms of can I get there, that's about addressing any barriers that come when accessing a product service space or policy um, and accessibility fits right in here. So using the library as an example, um, can I get to the library? Um, in terms of physical accessibility, is the location somewhere that I can reach conveniently and comfortably? Once I'm there, will I be able to get in if there is stairs only access or a narrow door frame? Um, will it work for people with walking frames, using canes, in wheelchairs, with prams? Um, in terms of entry, is it members only entry in public libraries? Of course not. However, for university libraries, you might actually have to be a student or a staff member to be able to enter. Um, am I able to afford that? Can I understand the signage to be able to get in? 
in terms of a digital library and the assets that come with um, digital content, am I able to connect to the internet? Can I get to the website? Do I know what it is? And is the information on the website presented in a way that I can interact with? Then moving into the can I play their space, it's about usability and that addresses the barriers that come with using the product service or space. So now that I've gotten to the library, whether it's the online version or the physical space version, um, can I actually use it? Does the wayfinding through the shelves um, or through the website make sense to me? Can I understand the information? Am I able to find what I need? Does it work uh, based on how I'm interacting with it? Then moving into the can I stay there space, it's about addressing the barriers that come with enjoying the product or service and coming back. So at the end of the day, we're talking a lot about personalization. So can I get help when I'm stuck? Does the help that I receive meet my needs in terms of language, digital literacy? Um, are the services flexible to cater towards my needs? Do I feel welcome here in terms of the way that I dress and other parts of my identity? Um, for instance, the information and data you're collecting in form fields, as well as privacy concerns. And do, does the product or service remember my needs so I don't need to set it up again? For example, if I've requested that my preferred way of communicating is via written communications like SMS and not phone calls um, because I'm deaf or hard of hearing, um, will you remember that and respect that the next time that I come back? So I've included the inclusive design framework here to illustrate that while accessibility and digital accessibility is really important, addressing it alone doesn't ensure that your product or service is inclusive. So it's also very important to consider inclusive processes, language and communications. So accessibility we can define as the ability of a system to match the needs of an individual. And it's often a word that's um, it's often associated with disability. So I'd like to unpack that for a moment. Um, looking at this definition of disability, a mismatch between the needs of the individual and the features that are offered by the world around them. And this may include a system, a space, or a policy. For example, if the main form of learning is um, providing um, articles to read and writing long essays, then a student with dyslexia may not be able to fully participate experiencing difficulties with this written content. Mm -hmm. However, if the learning content that's provided is through video or audio, then this particular student is not disabled by the learning content that's offered to them. And traditionally, disability was seen as a personal attribute using the medical model of disability. Um, and with that lens, um, the world tries to change the person so that they are less disabled and more like able-bodied people. More and more now, we're looking at disability in terms of the social model, where anyone can experience disability at any point in time. And the World Health Organization now defines disability as that mismatch in the interactions between the world and the features that the person has. And that also means that the number of people who experience disability at any point in time is very substantial because a disability can be permanent, temporary, or situational. So for example, a person without a hand or a person with arthritis or someone who speaks um, no English will all experience difficulties when it comes to using a QWERTY keyboard to type. A deaf or hard of hearing person as pictured on screen um, and a person with an, an ear infection or someone wearing noise cancelling headphones may experience difficulty hearing you when you speak to them. And these difficulties occur because there's a mismatch between the person and the environment. Now, solving for these mismatches creates better experiences for everyone. And there are plenty of examples of these all around us. If you think about closed captioning, those were originally designed um, to make video and audio content accessible and um, 
and enjoyable for people who are deaf or hard of hearing so that they can engage with the content. However, nowadays, um, captions uh, have become a mainstream feature and they're useful in situations where you might be on a train and have forgotten your headphones or be a student in a lecture trying to hide that you're watching a different video. Um, if we think about curb cuts on the street, so the slopes that allow people to get from the road up onto the sidewalk, those were originally created after a long lobby and rally um, to enable people in wheelchairs and with different mobility impairments to be able to access streets and places. However, they also benefit people pushing prams, pushing bikes, on skateboards, if you sprain an ankle, they, it benefits everyone. Um, if you think about the electric toothbrush, there's two stories that come with this. One is that they were created for nurses um, so that they um, could clean patients' teeth um, so that the last patient that they cleaned wouldn't have dirtier teeth than the first because, as you can imagine, it gets pretty tiring scrubbing someone else's teeth and a ward full of people. However, the other story is also that they were created for people with um, motor impairments. Um, these days, it has definitely become a mainstream product. Um, how many people use an electric toothbrush in the room? Um, voice assist technology is another example. So there are countless examples that show that if you design for people who experience the most mismatch, you could be reaching up to four times the intended audience. And that's a stat from one of our reports, the benefit of designing for everyone. So what happens then? when we don't consider the needs of different people. In Australia, we have a very diverse society um, with at least 5 million Australians who are vulnerable to exclusion because the products, services and policies have been designed without considering different mismatches experienced by people such as the elderly, people with disability, um, people with a long-term health condition, those living in regional and rural areas and people with low digital or English literacy. And websites are a fantastic example of those because over 96% of website homepages actually fail web content accessibility guidelines. And so what that means is that people who use assistive technology like screen readers, voice to text, keyboard only navigation, or eye tracking um, technology to navigate websites without a mouse, they may be excluded or have significant issues using the web. And the reason for this is because most of the digital world has been created without considering the mismatches that might be experienced by people who are blind or have low vision, uh, people with low English or digital literacy. I'm going to show you a quick video of what that experience actually looks like when someone using a screen reader um, navigates through an inaccessible PDF. Um, I'm just going to ask for a thumbs up if you can hear what's going on and if that's moving as well. Is the sound coming through? The sound's not coming through, Michelle. When you share, you'll need to click um, the or tick the box that has share sound. Yeah, I ticked that box as well. I wonder if it's because I have myself muted on this laptop. Is that working? It's feeding back, unfortunately. Is that coming through? It's not, Michelle. No. Nope. Okay. I'll just audio describe what's going on on screen then. So what's happening here is that the PDF is re. Oh, 
Yes. And because it's not tagged correctly, then what the screen reader will actually read is most popular beaches temperatures. According to US News, the top three in the table below, the June 2021. So it doesn't recognize that there are two different columns of information and the page loses its page structure um, when it's incorrectly tagged. Um, unfortunately, I'm just going to switch back to my other. That should be a bit better for everyone. Yeah, cool. So inaccessible documents are all around us and all across the web. So what can we do to make um, to make web content more accessible and inclusive? Um, if you start with accessibility in mind, then it gets a lot easier than going back to remediate the document. So looking at websites and documents, here are some things that we can all start with. It's not an exhaustive list of how to create accessible websites and documents, um, but it, it does serve as a great starting point for anyone who would like to um, make their documents or websites readable to screen readers. So headings and structures. I have a screenshot on the side of this slide here, which is the styles panel in a Word document. So while with websites, it requires tagging of headings and content and correct labeling, even when you're creating a Word document by assigning the right style that's associated with the right heading structure, content or title, that will mean that you've prepared your Word document um, to be created into a more accessible PDF when that happens. It gives your document that structure. Um, when you're looking at images, then adding an alt text for them that describes what the image has. Um, I will show you that on this screen, actually. So looking at the alt text in here, so it's a short description of what you're seeing um, visually on screen. And you can do this in PowerPoint, in Word, in PDFs, as well as on websites. Hyperlinks are another one um, that tend um, to be around um, in terms of a mistake quite often. So hyperlinks, which are described, uh, which are hyperlinked on the word here, for a screen reader user navigating through the web quickly, they might bring up a list of all links that are available um, on the website or in the document. So by having your link associated to the word here, what the person might be hearing is links available on this page. Here, 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 with no idea of where this here link is going to take them. So by naming and labeling your hyperlinks in a meaningful way, that will allow people to quickly flick through um, where those links will take them. Then in terms of color contrast, there are heaps of color contrast checkers that are available out there. A really great one that shows you visually what the colors would turn out um, to look like for people with different um, color blindness is who can use color contrast checker. I can share the link in the chat as well. And that just sets you up for success with any color combinations that you're looking to use on any of your documents or your websites. Then reading order is something that is quite neat in PowerPoint and it matters in PowerPoints as well. So if you look at the selection pane, which you can bring up after selecting an object and going into 
shape format in a range and bring up that selection pane. The order that this needs to be is a little bit opposite of what you'd expect. And it's going from bottom up. So the reading order goes from the title object to my content and then to the picture. So imagine if you had that out of order, then the screen reader would read headings and structure before reading the title of the page. I've also got a link here to simple web accessibility guidelines. So um, I'm sure that you'll find something else that's new and useful from that link. I'm just going to open my screen back up. Now, as we were talking about before, going beyond accessibility is really important in moving from having an accessible product service or space to having an inclusive product service or space. Some questions or topics to think about are flexibility. So how are you presenting your content only in one way and only allowing people to engage um, with written content? Um, are people able to engage with your content in the way that best suits them? So for some people, that might be video with both a visual and an audio um, with captions as well. For others, that might be an Auslan translation. Um, for some, it might be reading, for others, it might just be static pictures, but also allowing an offline option, um, especially for forms and for getting help via the phone or in person means that people are able to engage with you in the way that best suits them. Then when we look at inclusive language, it's about using language that um, will be easily understood by people who may not be as familiar with English or who have lower English literacy. So will someone in year four or five be able to understand the content that you're delivering to them? The other question to ask when it comes to language is, am I othering anyone with the way that I'm asking questions or the way that I have described my service? Um, this is particularly important in form fields um, where questions around gender and title tend to be quite binary definitions of gender and um, excludes or creates a lot of tension with our LGBTQ plus community. Um, and lastly, across all of your interactions, um, have you asked whether you can provide any accessibility requirements so that people can fully participate, whether that be captions, translators, low sensory spaces? I'm going to end us off with one of my favorite quotes about inclusive design. Um, it's from Susan Goldman, and it's inclusive design doesn't mean you're designing one thing for all people, you're designing a diversity of ways to participate so that everyone has a sense of belonging. I love this because it's, it really describes the variations that we have um, across our human experience and at the same time. Um, it's constantly changing. So it's not designing um, something for an average person. It's designing flexibility and personalization within your web content and within the way that you're asking people to engage with you so that you can serve each individual as an individual. So I've taken a big, like, broad brush over inclusive design and some um, simple tips and tricks that I have found useful on my journey learning about inclusive design and accessibility um, to share with you today. Half an hour is really um, a short amount of time to encapsulate this big world of inclusive design and accessibility. So I'd love for you to share in the chat what about this has resonated the most with you and what's one thing that you can start doing from today to make your designs, including your content, your documents, um, your meetings, your comms, more access accessible and inclusive. And I'd love to see your thoughts on that in the chat. Um, 
also conscious of time. So if you continue dropping that there, I'll have a great time reading through it. Um, I also have Miles from Center for Inclusive Design in the call today with me. I've popped out contact details on the screen. Um, Miles, you are welcome to drop them in the chat as well. So if you would like to continue the conversation with us about doc remediation, about web accessibility or inclusive design, then we are very happy to continue that conversation. Thank you so much for caring about inclusion and being interested in accessibility. The last thought that I want to leave you is that inclusion takes intentional practice and it's a journey rather than a destination because our world's constantly changing and our needs are constantly changing and adapting to this world. What was once accessible and inclusive today might not be the same in a year. So we're also constantly learning. And so I hope you've taken away something useful for your day to day. Thanks everyone. And apologies for the noise issues. No, you're right. Thank you, Michelle. I'm sure I'm, I'm seeing all through chat that everyone's got a lot out of it. So thank you very much. Um, we really do appreciate your time and your effort in presenting to us today. Um, if, if you have any questions or anything for Michelle, please put them up in the chat and Michelle can keep an eye on that um, and answer as she needs to. Um, we'll keep questions to the end. Um, if we've got time, we might not run we might run out of time. But I'd like to introduce our second guest speaker today, Rosie from Digital Access Team at Vision Australia. Now, Rosie is proudly autistic and a digital accessibilities officer with the digital, or well, from the Digital Access Team at Vision Australia. She's passionate about accessibility and communications, marketing and social media, and how we can make accessibility more accessible for all to learn. Today, Rosie will be discussing writing inclusive alternative text from the basics of what alt text is, why it matters, how it makes the web more accessible to some deeper discussion into why the language we use in alt text is important to ensure inclusion. So I'm gonna hand over to Rosie. Brilliant. Thank you so much for that introduction, Amy. Um, and thank you so much to Michelle. I feel like you've given me a really excellent uh, jumping point to go to um, into my presentation. I saw a couple of comments in the chat uh, of people wondering more about alt text. So um, you got it right here. I'm ready to, to give you this information as well. So thank you so much, Michelle. Um, an excellent presentation. Like Amy said, I'm going to be talking about um, writing inclusive alternative text. Um, I'm hoping that you can all see my slides. So a thumbs up or a confirmation. Brilliant. Thanks, Amy. All right. Before I get started, I'd just like to do an acknowledgement of country. Um, Vision Australia acknowledges Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples as the first Australians and the traditional owners of the land across our working area. We pay our respect to elders past and present in maintaining their cultures, country and spiritual connection to the lands and waters. Vision Australia acknowledges and respects the genuine diversity and richness of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander cultures across Australia. I'd also like to um, acknowledge disabled First Nations people and the importance of including an intersectional approach when discussing disability and accessibility, especially when the barriers we'll speak of um, throughout this session today are likely more pronounced due to the systematic oppression of First Nations people in Australia. I'd like to give a little description of this artwork that I have on screen at the moment. Um, Vision Australia commissioned Holly McLennan Brown, who's a proud Yorta Yorta woman and a contemporary Aboriginal artist to produce artwork for our reconciliation action plan. The circles in the centre of the artwork represent the Vision Australia community and the U shapes represent people and clients coming together uh, with Vision Australia. Leading from the centre of the artwork are pathways with paw prints along each pathway. The white lines off this are the various pathways and services that Vision Australia offers to people who are blind or have low vision. Vision Australia's four areas of service focus, employment, education, social inclusion and independence are also highlighted within the artwork. Today, I'm speaking to you from Luchawita, which is Tasmanian Aboriginal land. Uh, for many years, the Palawa people have referred to this land as Palanwini Larini Kanabaluka, which means the town near the River Tamar, um, which is now known as Launceston. Um, I encourage you to take a moment to think about the lands that you're on today. And I've seen everyone doing that in the chat already. So that's excellent. 
a little bit of a background of uh, Vision Australia and um, the digital access team, which is the team that I'm a part of. Um, Vision Australia as a whole is main focus is uh, services surrounding blindness and low vision. Uh, the digital access team, which is the team that I'm from, uh, works across all disability groups. Uh, we provide accessibility consulting um, at all stages of digital projects and 100% of our profits return to supporting people who are blind or have low vision. Um, and we have some illustrations here. Uh, we have a woman in a wheelchair um, and we also have a, a man using a white cane um, and he's wearing glasses. Who am I since I'm spending the next 20 or so minutes with you? Um, Amy's already mostly covered it. Um, there's a little illustration here of me. I've got dark brown um, hair that's quite floofy. It's looking okay today, so that's good. Um, I've got light um, white skin and bright rosy red cheeks. Um, in the illustration, I'm wearing a yellow shirt and rainbow overalls. Uh, I have some tattoos on my arm and I'm also holding a duck. Um, the reason why I'm holding a duck is because I absolutely love ducks. They're one of my special interests um, and I'm a proud autistic person. What are we getting up to today in this 20 minute session? Um, so a little bit of an agenda for you. We're going to start is with what is alternative text or um, lovingly known as alt text shortened. Um, why does alt text matter? Getting into some of the nitty gritties and the do's and don'ts of writing alt text and also why the language we use um, in alt text really matters and how we can move to having more inclusive alt text to ensure that we're not um, erasing um, any identities through alt text. And I'll leave you with some uh, resources at the end as well. How does alt text link to today's theme? So today's theme, I don't know if you've read it, it says, even if you're not uh, responsible for your website design, it's important to be across what makes websites accessible. It's not just about font size and colors when you're putting together content, the words you use and the way you describe things can be uh, the difference between inclusive and exclusive. What we're really focusing on um, in alt text and describing uh, images, we're focusing on those words you use. And um, in the second half, we'll be talking about the way you describe things, um, making sure we're being the most inclusive possible um, in our alt text. So what is alternative text? Um, Michelle touched on it a little bit in her presentation. But alternative text or alt text is a visually hidden description of what appears in an image. The reason it's visually hidden is that people who are blind or have low vision use assistive or adaptive technology called screen readers, which reads the description to them. Now, alt text isn't always visually hidden. You might have seen on Twitter recently, um, alt text is now uh, available to be seen by everyone. You hit the little alt button and you can see the alt text that people have written or if they haven't written any alt text, um, but it's typically, visual, uh, it's typically visually hidden um, and only accessed by screen reader users. Alt text is an area that is extremely subjective and you'll probably see why as we go through um, this presentation. And there are lots of arguments about what should and shouldn't be included. Um, and different people who are blind or have low vision who utilize alt text have different views and preferences. So that's important to keep in mind as we go through. Um, and we have a little icon um, on the slide here of an uh, image uh, with some little writing next to it. So why does alt text matter? Why should we care about alt text? Why should we write it? Using alt text enables people who are blind or low vision, who use a screen reader to be able to perceive important visual information that is given via images or icons. And we can see uh, an image here of someone using a braille reader with their screen reader to be able to uh, read um, what's on the screen as well uh, via a braille output. Screen readers also operate via audio output as well. Without alt text, people who are blind or have low vision may not have access to key information, and this can shape their perception of content um, in ways that are potentially incorrect. So people can potentially get the wrong meaning or the wrong message um, if we're not writing adequate alt text or we're not writing alt text at all. And this is an unequal experience, so we don't want that. We've got an example of what that could be. Um, so we've got a little image here of a graph. It's called Votes for Favourite Bird. 
And we have all our different votes. Um, owl, blue wren, magpie, penguin, duck. We can see that duck is winning. But especially thinking about in an education setting, if this was an image being used. Um, and we had the question, what's the most popular bird? Um, and we needed to answer it. Without alt text for this image, people who are blind or have low vision will not be able to answer the question. They don't have any description and they would, at best they would be guessing what the most popular bird is. Um, and that's not the experience that we want for people. There are two main types of images. We call them decorative images and informative images. We're mostly going to be focusing on informative images in this session, and those are the images that we write the alt text for. So informative images do require alt text, and they can be defined as images that provide additional information to the text content, um, and also complex images as well. And we have an example of an uh, image that is definitely providing additional information to the text content in this scenario. Um, it's sort of like a maths equations and, and written like this. It's probably even leaning over to our complex images as well, but it's definitely providing additional information to the text in this scenario. Decorative images, um, these do not require a description and they can generally be defined as images that don't provide any um, additional information to users who are cited. Um, there can be things like icons with labels or images with captions as well. I like to call them background images or eye candy is another favourite one that I hear them called. Um, and we can see an example of a decorative image um, on the screen here. It might just be a plain colour or it could be a photo as well that you're just using for visual interest, but it's not providing any additional context to the user. So let's look at an example of writing alt text. Um, so in this example, we have a little website. Um, someone's posted a blog post. It's called Breakfast. Um, and the text here says, what do you like to have for breakfast on the weekend? It's an excellent question that has many different answers. Today, I had the best breakfast. It was even gluten-free. See a picture of my yummy breakfast below. Now, none of the text in this blog post here actually gives uses any idea of what the breakfast is. So it never says what the breakfast might be. So it makes it really important for our image to have an alt text in this scenario. Otherwise cited users are getting more information. They're going to know what the breakfast is because they can see this image. Um, but our screen or blind or low vision who utilize a screen reader who have, don't have access to any alt text here are not gonna know what the breakfast is. Obviously, this is a very simplistic, fun example, but it can be a lot more serious than this. So let's look at, first of all, what we wouldn't want to make the alt text. I find that's the best way to sort of get your head around um, what should be included in the alt text, looking first at what we shouldn't include. So I have some examples here of what wouldn't be good to put in the alt text. And the first example that we have is image of pancakes. Now, there's two problems with this first alt text. Uh, first of all, it says image of. Now, a screen reader user is already going to know it's an image. Their screen reader is going to announce to them that it is an image or a graphic. So there's no need for us to say image of or graphic of um, because the screen reader user will already know that. The second problem is image of pancakes very, very general, not providing that much description. It is telling us what the breakfast is, um, but it's not providing that much information and um, of what's actually in this image. Another thing that we wouldn't want to make our alt text, the second one down, we wouldn't want to make it hashtag pancakes, hashtag blog, hashtag blog post, hashtag go viral, hashtag influencer. This is not helpful. Uh, we don't want to be putting hashtags or um, keywords for SEO or anything like that. We don't want to be putting that in our alt text. It's not helpful to our user to actually describe what the image is. Um, and it's going to create a lot of repetition as well. The next thing we wouldn't want to put in our alt text is how tasty are pancakes? They're flipping delicious. Did you like my joke? 
we don't want to be putting jokes or secret messages or links and things like that in our alt text. I'm especially seeing this on social media at the moment, uh, especially with Twitter, with a lot of people um, putting their uh, putting alt text into Twitter as Twitter's doing a lot of accessibility measures around alt text at the moment. Lots of people want to put a joke or a secret in there not helpful to our users um, and are not providing an adequate description. And the last thing is that we wouldn't want to make our alt text is beautiful, scrumptious, lovely cakes made in a pan. The pancakes are sitting on a rainbow painted plate with five pieces of paper towel underneath. The pancakes are a golden yellow brown like a young duckling who has rolled in the mud. There's wondrous stream, steam billowing from the plate of pancakes in gorgeous swells that fill my mind with teal blue ocean swells. Now, this is lovely. It's maybe poetic. We're getting our creative writing on here, but it's not useful to, to our user in this situation. So we don't want our alt text to be too verbose. Um, we don't need to write an alt text essay. Uh, we need to keep to the, to the point there. So looking at some examples of what could be the alt text for this scenario, I've got two different examples, one of which I wrote, one of which one of my colleagues wrote. The first one is a pile of freshly cooked pancakes on the kitchen table butter and marmalade is ready to be spread on top and the other one we've got is a stack of pancakes with steam rising off of it with butter and marmalade on the dining table so simple to the point in language that's not too verbose or uh, going over excuse me going over the top and in general, I like to say that the best way to write alt text is to write it as if someone had called out to you from the next room and asked um, what it looked like. Or another one I've heard is describe it in the way that you would describe to talking to someone on the phone um, when they're asking what something looks like. I also like to say that there's no correct ways to write alt text. It is subjective. It can cause debates. Everyone's going to have a different way of describing things. Um, but the most important thing is that we are writing alt text and it is enough to ensure that screen reader users are not missing out on key information. So when we're thinking about writing alt text, um, there's a couple of things to remember. Number one is that it depends on context. Alt text can change. Oh, I just hit my microphone. Sorry about that. Alt text can change depending on the scenario that an image is in. Alt text of something on a social media versus a, the same image used in a scientific article um, might be completely different. So we need to think about um, alt text in that way. There's not one, one right way to write alt text. And we want to be finding a balance between the intent of the author's image choice and also what's right for people who utilize alt text. And this might vary depending on the industry that you're in or the organization uh, that you work for. A really good example is uh, an organization that I worked for. They were uh, specially focused in um mental health and one uh, something really important for them in alt text um, was that they never put emotions onto the people that they were writing about in the alt text so they didn't want to write such and such is happy now this was because for them someone can look happy um, but they may be experiencing depression and so they never wanted to put emotions onto people so they stuck with um, and the way that they write their alt text um, across their organization is focusing more on what's physically there so someone is smiling for example rather than portraying an emotion onto them such as happy all right the last part that we're going to go into is why the language we use in alt text matters. Um, and I'd just like to look, give a content warning um, that uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers are advised that the following slides may contain an image of uh, deceased persons and the content um, may contain materials relating to the stolen generation that is confronting and disturbing and which might cause um, sadness or distress. It is on slide 20, um, which is about two slides away. So just a little warning there for you as well. In, that, uh, in this section, we'll be talking about how the erasure of race, gender and disability can affect meaning um, and can affect the way um, images are perceived by the alt text we write. So first of all, I want to look at race erasure in alt text. Um, and 
what I'm talking about here is from an article written by Tulu Adegbai, who writes an article about the case for describing race in alternative text. And she says, when we don't describe the race of someone in an image, we push the narrative that what our society deems as the default, usually a white person, is the default. We exclude other people and we make them invisible. Um, and we also, uh, she in her article, she writes, um, she makes a link to this tweet uh, from Harbin Germa, who is a human rights lawyer, a speaker, and the author of the book Harbin, the um, deafblind woman who conquered Harvard Law. Um, she's an excellent person to check out. And she writes this tweet that says, I'm so used to blind people saying that I thought they, sorry, I'm so used to blind people saying they thought I was white. It doesn't surprise me now. When you do image descriptions, don't skip race. Don't leave room for harmful assumptions. And she goes on uh, in that. And Harbin herself um, is a black woman. Um, she has uh, dark brown hair as well. And she's uh, pictured in the image down below. And she says, I'm not white, honest, blind people and vision, a visual accessibility. And I definitely recommend going and checking out uh, that video that she uh, made and also the article uh, from Tulu as well. I found another a study talking about this, um, and this is a study um, called um, It's Complicated, Negotiating Accessibility and Misrepresentations in Image Descriptions of Race, Gender and Disability, and that's the areas this study focuses on. And it talks about identity erasure in alt text as well. Um, and a quote from the study says, two participants, appearance seemed to give sighted people a clue as to how to interpret commentary on identity, so including things like race, gender and disability. And it's in its absence, they argued the disclosure of such information um, was necessary for them to have an equal opportunity to understand was, what was being shared. So within this study, um, there was uh, 25 participants, all of which were blind. Um, and they were also part of another minority group, such as being a person of color or were gender diverse. Um, they were non-binary or transgender or had multiple disabilities as well. So it focused on um, that sort of minority. Um, it was mentioned how difficult it was to engage in conversation online as they often didn't know the identity of people. Um, thinking about social media and thinking about um, having access to profile pictures as a sighted person, we're so used to just looking at someone's profile picture and making assumptions about them. But actually on a lot of social medias, profile pictures are don't have the ability to add alt text. So users were often having to go through people's social media, try and find images of them um, and try and find a description of them to actually know who they are um, and some important identity features about them. Um, one example that was used was someone using um so there was an example where uh someone was conversing with someone else online um uh, and it was sort of in a disability space and the a person online was using language that had been reclaimed um uh, th that is typically derogatory language, but has also been reclaimed by the disability community. Now, the person who was blind, who was interacting with them, wasn't sure whether the person was using this language in an ableist way and was not disabled themselves, or whether they were disabled and they were using uh, this language in a reclaimed way. And the same thing can be go for um people of color and things like that as well so it was really important for them to know that person's identity and certain parts about them to be able to engage in uh, a conversation with them and I really recommend checking out uh, this uh, study as well it's a very interesting one so this brings us to uh, describing uh, race and we're going to go into describing disability in alt text and how it can be really really important that we describe race we describe disability and gender as well um, so that we actually get the true meaning of an image so looking at this image that we have here i've got two examples describing the image so an alt text with reference to race and also alt text um, without reference to race. So looking at the first description, we've got a black and white photo of a priest and a man in a suit walking through two rows of children in uniforms. 
looking at the alt text with reference to race, a black and white photo of two white men, a man in a suit and a priest walking through two lines of young Aboriginal children in uniforms. You can see the difference between them. Race is, an import, is important in this image as it illustrates the power imbalance that is occurring between the white people and um, the Aboriginal children. Without race, the description of this image could be just any school, even a modern day one, if the photo wasn't black and white, and it gives no reference to the fact that uh, this is a mission and these were um, areas where Aboriginal children, uh, people, in this instance children, were placed after being forcibly removed from their traditional lands. So it's really important, especially in this historical context, um, to make sure that we're highlighting race within this image. Otherwise, the, the image has a different meaning. So I would really recommend reading Toulouse's article that I mentioned before, as she also shows examples of alt text with and without references to race, um, but in an African-American context as well. The second example, and this is the last example I have, um, is describing disability in alt text. So the first alt text that we have is without reference to disability. And the alt text is a teenage boy who is sitting, stares down a flight of stairs. Now, this alt text is technically not wrong. There's a teenage boy, he's sitting, he is staring down a flight of stairs but it's missing a really key component um, in the alt text of this image. So with reference to disability, we've got a teenage boy who is using a wheelchair, stares glumly um, at a flight of stairs. And this gives us a bit much bigger picture and understanding of what this image is actually about. It's about inaccessibility. Um, he's not able to use these stairs. He seems maybe upset. Um, and it gives us a much fuller image. So we're getting two different um, ideas of what this image is about when we don't reference disability within the image. So to finish up, um, we've got some general alt text tips. We want to describe the most important and informational elements of images. And this could include race, gender, and disability if known. Um, and that's really important as it can change the meaning of images. We don't want to start your alt text with image of. We talked about why that's important. We also want to include all text within the image, which is something we didn't really talk about, but it is important to include that in our alt text. We don't want to write an alt text essay, and we also don't want to be too general. So it's finding a happy medium between those. And lastly, if the image is complex, we might want to consider writing a long text description and providing a link to the long text description as well. And that's something I can talk about um more if people are interested finishing off with some resources that might help you on your alt text journey and learning to write more um alt text the alt text decision tree from the web accessibility initiative helps you decide if images are decorative or informative um the w3c way images tutorial a really really good one um and then those two uh, articles that I referred to, the case for describing race in alternative text by Tulu, uh, a deck by, and also the uh, study, it's complicated, negotiating accessibility and misrepresentation in image descriptions of race, gender, and disability. And I'll put those links in the chat as well after, um, if you're interested. Um, and thank you so much uh, for listening into my presentation. I really hope it helped you um, in getting a fuller understanding of alt text, especially um, if you hadn't heard of alt text before or if you had, um, some of those ideas around um, race erasure and identity erasure might be new to you. Um, so something to get thinking about. My contact details are up on the screen. I'm more than happy to answer questions uh, relating to this presentation or just more in generally. My email is rosie.luscombe at visionaustralia.org. You can find me on Twitter at beatbootrosie or on LinkedIn at Rosie Luscombe, but I'll pop those in the chat as well. Thank you so much. Um, we're just hitting two o'clock now, so right on time for you. Thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, we've, we've certainly got a, 
eye-opener today and I'm sure everyone is going to take something back um, to their libraries or to their schools and where they work and look at website divide. Now I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there today. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to all our guest speakers. It has been a beneficial webinar looking at accessibility in terms of websites and alt texts. Um, thank you to Alia President Vicky Edmonds for attending today. I would encourage everyone to join the e-list for Alia Disability Group so that you get all the information from today and our upcoming webinars. Our next webinar will be on the 16th of November. That seems like a long time away, but it's not really. And on learning from disability and inclusion officers working within libraries, supporting staff and disabilities. So once again, thank you to everybody. Um, and we'll hang around for a little while while Rosie answers a few questions, I think that are popping up in the chat. Um, but no, thank you again. Thanks everyone. Thanks for having us. Bye everyone. Bye.